Luke chapter 19, commencing reading at verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, Jesus spoke another parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, Jesus said, A certain nobleman went into a far company, country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten miners, and said to them, Do business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, master, your miner has earned 10 miners. And he said to him, well done, good servants. Because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, master, your miner has earned five miners. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, master, here is your miner, which I have kept Put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you, because you're an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit, you reap what you did not sow. And the master said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Well, why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from him and give it to the one who has 10 miners. But they said to him, master, he has 10 miners. The master said, for I say to you, well, Jesus says to us, for I say to you, that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Now, God, we pray that you would help us and give us insight and understanding as we study your word together this morning. In Jesus' name. Well, friends, we have now arrived at the end of our study through the Gospel of Mark. It's been a bit of a journey. We started more than a year ago. And I know you're probably saying, well, Brad, you have now totally lost the plot. You say we are finishing our study through, God, through Mark's Gospel, but you're teaching today through the Gospel of Luke. It's a story that doesn't even appear in the Gospel of Mark at all. Well, I hope I'm able to make it clear to you why I'm doing that in just a moment. But first, let me say, especially maybe for those of you who have come more recently, I want to explain to you why it is that we have been studying and focusing on the Gospel of Mark. We have been doing that because we want to learn to be faithful servants of Jesus. That's been our focus. That is our intent. And Mark's gospel is a really terrific book that helps us to learn to be a faithful servant. But in fact, the term that I've used as the title of the series, faithful servant, doesn't come from the gospel of Mark at all. It comes from the parable of the talents. And that parable is found in Matthew chapter 25. And so, now as we come to the end of and finish this series, I wanted to explore that parable, which we did two weeks ago, and also another parable, the one that we're looking at today, that is similar, although a little different. But it also helps us to understand what we should be doing 
if we want to be a faithful servant of Jesus. Because in these two parables, Jesus makes it very clear that his intent, his desire is to reward everyone who serves faithfully. And we want that to be us. Why do we want to be faithful servants? It's a good question. It's an important question. Now, we've answered that question often as we've made our way through, and I hope it's very clear to all of us by now, but specifically for those that have missed most of the series, the parable of the talents, in that parable, the master who we've had explained to us, that's Jesus, he comes back from a long journey. And in reality, Jesus is still on that journey right now. But when he arrives back, he gathers together his servants and he asks from his servants to give an account of what they have done with what the master has given to them, what the master has invested in them. How have they worked? How have they invested what the master has entrusted to them? And then the master gives a reward. And he says to them, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. But to those who have not worked, to those who have not invested the talents that the master gave to them, he did not reward them. In fact, he removes what has been given to them and he calls them wicked and lazy. And we know that one day soon, the Lord Jesus is returning and all who have accepted him as their Lord and their Savior are going to stand before him and, they, and, and we will be there in order to give an account of what we have done with our lives. We won't be there to give an account for our sin. And the reason for that is that all of our sin has been dealt with. If we are in Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus paid the price for our sin 2,000 years ago. And in doing so, he declared it is finished. So when we stand face to face with our Lord Jesus, we won't be talking about sin. But we will be there to give an account of what we have done with our lives since putting our faith in Jesus. If we have worked, if we have invested what he has entrusted to us and he has given us much, we can expect to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. But not every believer are going to hear those words and some are going to stand there in shame and they'll still be saved, but there will be no reward. And we don't want that to be us. And so we've studied this book and hopefully we are putting into practice what we've been learning so that we will be rewarded on that day. And today we come to a parable that is so much like the parable of the talents that we looked at two weeks ago that many have expected that it's teaching just the same things. It's so similar as if to be, well, it's just the same, but it's not the same. It's similar, but there are differences. And in those differences, there is a lot to learn. And in learning that, it will help us to live as faithful servants. One of the things about this story in Luke's gospel is where it is situated. We always talk about context. Where is the story in relation to the other things that are happening around it? And knowing what is before it and knowing what is after it is going to help us to understand this story. Immediately before the story we've read today, if you've got your Bible open in front, you'll see it's the story of Zacchaeus. And then what comes after is that marvelous story of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, what we call Palm Sunday. And those two stories help us to unlock the meaning of this parable. So with that context in mind, let me read again verse 11. It says, Now as they heard these things, that is the story of Zacchaeus, Jesus spoke another parable, 
because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So why does Jesus tell this parable? We've just been told. He tells this parable to correct a misunderstanding. They're coming close to Jerusalem. The disciples are expecting the kingdom of God is going to come. It's going to come now. We're going to experience that. We're going to live that. And they had a special understanding of what that kingdom was going to look like. When they reach the climax of their journey, when they arrive in Jerusalem, they are expecting that Jesus is going to be crowned as king, that he is going to rule all of Israel, that he is going to overthrow the oppression of the Romans, and that what is going to be restored is what has been promised throughout the scriptures, a kingdom that even exceeds the wonderful, marvelous days of King David and King Solomon. Because that's what the Bible says. The kingdom will extend far further than ever it did in all of that wonderful history. And because that's what the scriptures declare will take place, and because the disciples believe God and they take him at his word, they're expecting this to happen. There are signs all the way through, and we've looked at them as we've studied the Gospel of Mark, that they were expecting this was going to happen. But Jesus says to them, my friends, I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm going on a long journey. And this is what I want you to be doing while I'm going. And if you do, if you do these things... Jesus says to them, when I return and when I establish all these things that you are thinking about and that you are expecting and all the things that the scriptures have promised, then I'm going to reward you. I'm going to bless you. And you are going to rule with me and you are going to have authority alongside of me and under me. But that'll only happen if you are faithful. That will only happen if you are faithful. That's what Jesus is telling them in this parable. That's what Jesus is telling you and me. Friends, are you waiting for that kingdom? Are you looking forward to its fulfillment, the day when Jesus is crowned as king and he sits to rule upon the earth, then this is what you must do also. So pay close attention as we study this today. Verse 12, therefore Jesus says, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return And so he called 10 of his servants and delivered to them 10 miners and said to them, do business until I come. A miner is a a unit of money, a coin. Now this story, like I said before, it sounds familiar. This parable is very similar to the parable of the talents. And we studied that only two weeks ago. And there when we studied that, we studied the story in that parable of a servant who is given five talents, and another servant who is given two talents, and another one who is given one talent. But as we look at the two parables side by side, we see that there are similarities, but there are some differences. And we need to pay attention to those differences in order for us to get the meaning right and to apply it to our lives so that we can be faithful servants. In this story, the nobleman goes to a far country. It speaks of a significant period of time. It takes a long while to travel to a far country to receive the kingdom and to come back again. So Jesus is talking about having patience and continuing to be faithful and diligent until he returns. Jesus is saying to the disciples, I am going to receive my kingdom 
And that should grab the disciples' attention because they're looking forward to that kingdom. They're expecting it. And it should grab our attention too, especially if we are looking forward to his kingdom coming. We pray it, don't we, when we say the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. So one of the distinctions between this parable and the other one that is like it is that in this story, there are two distinct groups. Do you notice that? In the other parable, there aren't. There's only the one. We're only concerned with the servants. But in this parable, there is the servants, like in the parable of the talents. But here also, there is the crowd. They are called the citizens. But that doesn't appear in the other parable. Notice what it says in verse 14. But his citizens hated him. This is the nobleman. This is Jesus. And he sent, and they sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man reign over us. It's interesting. Who are the citizens? Who is Jesus referring to? Certainly in the context of this parable and what is about to take place with the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus is speaking about the nation of Israel. They are his citizens. In less than a week from this moment, this group of people are going to gather around him and, and Jesus will be up there on the platform with Pilate and on the other side of Pilate will be Barabbas. And what are they going to do? The citizens are going to cry out, crucify him. We do not want this king. We don't want him to reign over us. But I think it's more than just them. Last Sunday, we've been talking about the ministry that has been happening in the city. We went in there to worship and to give out some of the, 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 the Bibles that we've given there and other tracts and to talk to people, anybody who is willing to talk about Jesus. And as we ministered there amongst the city, I was struck by the attitude of some of the people, even more so the week before. Their hearts were hard to the things of God. Last week it was a bit better. Some were respectful and wanted to stop and to talk. And there were conversations with people the week before, but primarily there was this resistance, this hardness, this hatred. It was like the people are saying, we do not want Jesus as our king. So much like this attitude. So when the nobleman comes back, notice in this story, as we skip to the end of it a little bit, um, that, that the nobleman deals with both groups. He deals with the servants and he deals with the citizens, but he deals with them separately. The first thing he does is he deals with the servants. And so this is what he says, he, what it says. He, he comes to take care of them. So he, he invites them to come and to give an account of what has been entrusted to them. What have they done with the minor that he gave to each one of them? And first comes the man whose minor had earned 10. And he says to the, to the nobleman, look, I invested your miner, I put it to work and it has now earned 10 miners. And the nobleman says, well done, good servants. Because you were faithful in a little, have authority over 10 cities. And the second servant comes in and he says, master, your miner has earned five miners. And he too is met with the pleasure of his master. Well done have authority over five cities. The master rewards them according to their faithfulness. But here again is another difference between this parable and the parable of the talents. What's interesting is that the reward is different. This time, the faithful servant is given authority 
over a place or a region, a city. Now, we don't know exactly with any great clarity what that's going to look like in the eternal kingdom, but we know that what Jesus is showing us is that those who are faithful with what Jesus has entrusted to us will be given authority in his kingdom. Now, I hope that gives you a reason to look forward with great anticipation and expectation. And I also hope that it encourages you to invest wisely. Because what happens to the third servant, the one who just takes his minor and buries it in a handkerchief? What does he earn? Nothing. And so the king responds to him and says, uh, the nobleman responds, well, he's come back as a king because he's now got his kingdom. Take the minor from him and give it to the one who has 10 minors. So how much authority does this man have? None. None. Nothing. And I've said it before and I I must continue to make this clear. There are, I believe there are going to be Christians in heaven who are disappointed. They've been told wrongly or they've thought wrongly. They've expected that when we arrive home, when Jesus comes and takes us home, everyone is going to be equal. But they're wrong. They haven't been reading their Bible. Now, when they get to heaven, they're not going to be upset about what they discover. Their heaven's going to be amazing. But they will be disappointed when they realize that they didn't store up for themselves treasure that is in heaven. They didn't seek first the kingdom of God. They didn't pay it forward. They will be saved. They will arrive in heaven with nothing to show for it and there will be no reward. Again, I need to make this clear. I've said it already today, but I don't want to be any, people misunderstand this. You can't earn your salvation. We're not working to earn our way into heaven because your salvation is 100% paid for on the cross of Calvary. Jesus did that 2,000 years ago. Our service to Jesus doesn't add to that. It can't. If you believe that Jesus is God, that he is your saviour, then through that faith, you are saved. But you will be rewarded for faithfulness. Your faithfulness is what governs your inheritance. And incidentally, it is your inheritance that you can lose if you are not faithful. And there's some food for thought. You can work hard. You can store up treasure that is in heaven. And then if you turn around and you blow it one way or the other, you can lose that inheritance. That's what the Apostle Paul was so concerned about. He was determined to run all his race. Remember, he said, lest I run in vain, all that I have done, all that work that I have done should come to nothing. He was worried he could lose his reward. And so he was determined to finish the race well. Now, friends, if we look at this story, and this is where having your Bible open could be really helpful, you and I are living between verse 14 and 15. That's where we are today. You are living between the point when the master entrusted the servants with a task and the point in which he comes to reward our faithfulness. And that's good news. You know why it's good news? We've still got time to do something about it. We are still running our race. And so this leads me to a second distinction in this story between it and the parable of the talents. In the parable of the talents, each servant is given a different number of talents. One is given five, one is given two, one is given one. And each of them are given according to their abilities, right? But this story, there are 10, there are 10 servants and each servant is given one minor. Everyone gets the same amount. It's not based on gift. 
It's not based on ability. And then Jesus gives us three illustrations of the response of the master to the investment or to the work of the servant. Now, we're not told 10 responses, right? But we would expect the master would have gone down all 10 and responded with all of them. Why didn't, it, why didn't we get all 10? Well, actually, it's not necessary because Jesus is simply making a point. The other ones would all be superfluous. What happens if you do this much? What happens if you do a different amount? What happens if you do nothing? The reward will be according to what you do, how it is invested. Though each servant was only given one minor, the return on investment would determine the reward. I sound like a financial planner, but I hope you know what I mean. I'm not a financial planner, please believe me. A greater return would mean greater authority in the kingdom. Do you understand? But why only one minor given to each servant? It was, could have been five, could have been three, could have been anything. Well, here is this other clear distinction between the parables. Why is there a difference? What is Jesus speaking about on this occasion? It's really important that we understand this. The parable of the talents speaks of gifts. God gives gifts to the church, to the body of Christ, in order to serve the church, to serve the body of Christ, to work together to build his church. That's the purpose of that parable. That's what it's speaking about. But the parable of the miners speaks of the gospel. This speaks of the gospel. So the Holy Spirit gives gifts to the church to serve one another, to build up the body of Christ. And there are rewards for that. But Jesus gives us the gospel. And he says, I want you to share it. If you are going to be faithful, you are the one that, we, that will share it. We are commanded to share the gospel. We are all given the same gospel. It's not dependent upon giftedness. It's not. We have this thing in our head that there are evangelists and they're the gifted ones that share the gospel. No. Every one of us has been given the gospel to share. And this is highlighted, like I said before, by the story around it. The, the story immediately before it is the story of Zacchaeus. And the final words in that story are found in verses 9 and 10. And this is what happens. Jesus, speaking to the people there that have witnessed what has happened and the transformation that has taken place in Zacchaeus' life, says this, Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. This parable is not a parable of giftedness. It's a parable of faithfulness. Are you faithfully living the gospel? Are you faithfully sharing the gospel? Remember, we're still living between verses 14 and verse 15. There's still time for us to put things right and to finish well. Recently, I've been amongst people who have been sharing the gospel for many, many years, amongst the group that go into the city, are those that have been doing this for a long time. And they're the kind of people that will share the gospel with friends and colleagues and strangers alike, whatever opportunity is before them. And you know, as I'm talking to them and I'm, I'm really enjoying engaging with them, they're telling me things that I'm less aware of because I haven't been around so many people like that before. And they tell me that they are now seeing that in our city at least, more and more people are out there sharing the good news with people. And I wonder why that is. Why is it that now Jesus is stirring that in the hearts of the church to get out there and not just share it and witness to colleagues and friends, but to go out and witness to strangers. 
And I wonder if it might be one of two reasons. This is my idea. You can think about that and tell me I'm wrong if you like. It could be idea number one because the window for sharing the gospel in our city is closing. We have a government in power who hates biblical Christianity. Hates biblical Christianity. Don't hate Christianity. They want to change Christianity for it to be something that doesn't reflect what the Bible teaches us. But they hate biblical faith and Christianity. You just have to look at their track record. If you're in any misconception about that, come and talk to me. I'll show you a couple of things and it'll make it be, put it beyond doubt. But there is also another more sobering reason why it might be that this is happening. It could be that the day of our Lord's return is about to take place. And that also, now you can suggest other reasons if you like. I'm more than happy to hear them, but they're the two that immediately come to mind for me. We must always be living day by day with the knowledge and the expectation that soon Jesus will come for us. And when he comes, he will reward us for faithfulness. Now, if you're saying, well, Brad, how do I start? How do I get involved? Because I'm not good at speaking and I'm not good at sharing the gospel with somebody. How do I get involved with sharing the good news? How do I be a faithful servant? I want to I suggest just two very simple ways of doing that. Firstly, pray with us. If we don't pray, it'll be fruitless. We need a team to pray. The team that gathers in the room or at the back or whatever to pray is every bit as important as the team that are playing the keyboard and singing the songs that builds the atmosphere in the place and the team that are out there giving the tracts and the Bibles and, and talking to people. It is a team and we need people to do that. So pray with us. We said this past week we experienced a breakthrough the week before was hard. I have no doubt at all that that was because of prayer. So let's pray. So that's number one. Number two might seem a little bit more confronting, but I want you to think of it not as confronting. Firstly, I want to say thank you for all of those people that keep bringing boxes in that they've stamped um, so many people have been faithfully doing that week after week. I haven't touched a stamp, so I haven't done any of that, and that is beautiful. That's really lovely. That's a part of the work that has needed to be done. But we need to get them into people's hands. And if you're going to leave it to me to distribute 2,000, they're going to be there for a long, long time, okay? It's going to take a long while. And so I want to issue you a challenge. And I'm going to do this as well. Here's a challenge. I'm not commanding you do anything. But I would like to invite you. When you leave today, grab five. If you want to grab more, that's okay. If you think you can do it. But I would like to invite you to grab five. And as you do, pray. And say, God, who would you like me to give one of these to? All week I'm going to meet people. Some are strangers, some are people that I've known for a long time, some are family. Who would you like me to give these to? And then pray for the person that you're going to give it to. And then just to give you an example of what you might do and maybe just how easy it could be, as you nervously, some of us less nervous than others, but that's okay, nervousness is important, the nervousness um, will actually help us to understand how significant and how important this occasion is. But as you go up to that person, maybe you might like to say something like this or come up with your own thing. Hey, you know, it's Christmas time. And that's such a special time because it reminds us that God sent his son to the world. And his son, Jesus, has made such a difference in my life. And so I'd like to give you this book. 
It's a gift. It doesn't cost you anything. It's just a gift, and it'll tell you a little bit about the life of Jesus. I'd love you to read it, and then you could decide for yourself if Jesus could make a difference in your life as well. Does that sound easy enough? There are many ways that we can share the gospel. But I don't think it gets much easier than that. So let's be faithful servants and share the good news. I'll encourage you. I'm not going to be standing at the door giving everybody five. I'm not going down that path. But if somebody wants to grab another box, there's a box just on the floor there as well. And just as you pass by and you look at them and you say, I'm not sure, Jesus, whether I can do that, but I know that with your strength we can make this happen and I'm prepared to give it a go. That's a pretty good start, I reckon. All right, there's one other thing I have to cover before we finish. Because I told you there were two different groups and the master has come and we've focused a lot and that's been the primary focus today on how our master comes to reward his servants. But what about the second group in this story? What about the citizens? Now this part's frightening. I don't think there's any other word for it. Read verse 27. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. So we've got to ask the question, who are, the, who are God's enemies? And the Bible leaves us in no doubt, at least in my mind, that anyone who does not put their faith in Jesus for salvation Anyone who is still unreconciled to God through faith is an enemy of God. On the day of judgment, those who are the enemies of the righteous King, our Lord Jesus, will be collected and they'll face, face the punishment for their sin. It's a horrible reality, but it is a just reality. God is righteous, he is holy, he is just in all that he does. It's not his will that any should perish. His desire would be that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and would come to faith in him. But God doesn't always get what he wants. I think some of us sometimes think he does. I want to share one final story from our outreach last Sunday. There was a lady who was offended by what we were doing. Don't smile, Isabella. You know where I'm going with this. When we arrived to set up, we were patient while we waited because where we had sensed God was sending us, there was a market on that site and we needed them to pack up. When a space became available, we immediately moved in and just began to set up our equipment quietly while we waited for the rest of the people around us to finish packing up their stalls. While we had done that, immediately the team that were there to hand out tracts and, and to meet people began doing that up and down the street, some further away and some nearby. They were loving, they were respectful. You should watch these people in action. They are inspiring, they are great. Well, seeing this happen, there was a lady, just a stall or two alongside of us. She was clearing her gear away and she began to curse and to swear at us. Some of our team gathered around her. They were very polite, loving, respectful. They even offered to carry things for her and be helpful, but she refused. Moments later, we saw she had walked away and was calling the security to come over who came and asked us to move. Now moving was an inconvenience because we had set up the equipment but it was only a minor inconvenience because what turned out to be a difficulty turned out to be a, a, a blessing because we ended up in a much better location. In fact we were right outside the doors of Hamer Hall where inside they were, there was a performance of Handel's Messiah going on and we were there as people would walk out they came out in the intermission and listened and then there, were, there was an opportunity to, to gather with them. It was a real blessing. But it's what happened to this lady who was offended. And remember, she was offended not at us. 
she was offended at our king. And it's that that I want to draw our attention to. As she continued to pack up her market, I, don't, I can't tell you what she was feeling. Maybe she was feeling justified. Maybe she was feeling angry. Maybe angry at us. Maybe angry at Christians in general. Maybe angry with God. I don't know what has transpired in her life. But whatever happened, a stand fell on her. And she required assistance in order to get free from underneath this stand. Now, our immediate thought was distress and concern for her. Most of us didn't see this happen. Uh, was she all right? Yes, she was fine. She wasn't harmed. Maybe a little humbled. But we're praying that this minor incident that has happened to her will be the warning that she needs that would bring her to Jesus before she faces the judgment that she will undoubtedly face if she doesn't turn. So I just want to finish this morning by asking two questions. First question is this. It's, this one's kind of a two-part, but it's one question really. Are you serving God with the talents, that is the gifts that he has given you? Are you working alongside your brothers and sisters in Christ to build his church? Because if you do, if you are doing that and you're faithful in that and you finish well, then the Lord is coming to reward you. And the Bible tells us that that reward is that you will enter into the joy of your Lord. You will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. But then the second part of that alongside of that is, are you living the gospel? Are you sharing the good news with those around about you? Because the, the, the reward for that is authority in the kingdom, ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus when he returns. So are you doing those things? Are you a faithful servant, serving with the talents and sharing the gospel that has been entrusted to you? The second question, which is really the first question and I hope that will make sense. It's a very simple one. Are you a servant or are you a citizen? Are you a servant or are you a citizen? If you're a servant, you have put your faith in Jesus. You are a part of the family and you are serving him out of love for him in order to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. But if you, have, if you are a citizen, that means if you are someone who has never received you never accepted Jesus as your rightful king and savior. You've never received the free gift of salvation that Jesus died to bring you. Then I want to encourage you to do that right now. Right now. Because judgment is coming on all citizens. There are no excuses. We will have nothing that we can say in that moment that would say, oh, okay, you're an exemption. It just doesn't work that way. But the, and here's the, the critical thing. The offer of forgiveness and eternal life is available to everyone. It's available to anyone who wants to receive it. And so just with the two minutes that are remaining before the clock ticks over to midday, let me tell you how simple it is to receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. It's as simple as A, B, C. A, Admit that you've sinned and you fall short of God's standard. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. B, believe that Jesus is God, that he died on the cross for you. 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. C, call on Jesus personally. Tell him, yes, Lord, I want you as my king. Will you be my saviour and my Lord? And the promise of scripture is everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone can do this. Everyone is invited. God doesn't want any to perish, but we need to choose to receive Jesus' gift of salvation. So if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, do it right now. Wait no longer. Admit that you've sinned. 
Believe that Jesus died to forgive your sin and call on him as your saviour and Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, firstly, for any that, is, that, that are with us, either in this building or online, who have never received that free gift of salvation, I pray that you would just make yourself so real to them right now. I don't know what their experience would be. I know for me it was butterflies in the stomach and just a, a knowledge in the mind that this is I needed to respond. I couldn't hold back. And I pray that nothing would keep them from just getting on their knees right now, maybe physically on their knees, but certainly humbling themselves before you and say, Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe, Jesus, you died to save my sin. Would you forgive my sin? I call on you as my Lord and Savior. And on the authority of scripture, that they would know and they would feel that, that certainty as the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in their life, just as is promised, and that is the deposit, that is the thing that is the guarantee that we now belong to you for all eternity. And that they would join with us. They would share with us the joy, whether it's online again or, or here in person. Yes, I've done that. And we would celebrate together and, and, and then they would you know, be baptized and, 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 and continue to be a part of your family and grow and, and use the gifts that you've given them to serve as we work together to build your church and that they would know the joy of what it is of sharing the gospel with others. And Jesus, for all of us, we ask for your forgiveness when we've decided to put that, that minor in a handkerchief We've buried it away. We've kept it to ourselves. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to give us a clear understanding of, of what is at stake in all of this. And that you would light in us a fire that you lit in the disciples, that you lit in the, the followers in, 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 in the early church as they came to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and immediately just testified and witnessed to all those, anybody that would listen, they would tell them about Jesus and their passion and their joy. It was just infectious. I pray that you would do that in us. And Lord, that you would add to your number those who are being saved just as you have promised. I pray for the team that are going out today. Lord, anoint them and bless them and I know you're going to reward their faithfulness that much as promised. But I pray that there would be fruit from their work today. Not because I have to twist your arm, because I know on the authority of Scripture that you want there to be fruit. That you would work in all of us what pleases you. We give you all the glory. We tell you that we love you and we are so looking forward to your return. And we thank you for this day, an opportunity for us to be witnesses to the best news ever this Christmas. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me bless you. And uh, I just pray that, that the Holy Spirit continues to minister to you and and tells you what it is that he wants you to do. And that he give you strength and courage. And that same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead would work in you what it has been doing through faithful followers for the last 2,000 years. Jesus said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to do everything I told you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless.